My name is Garrett DeCastro, owner of Premier Landscape in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. We specialize in hardscape and landscape construction, and I am a hardscaper. So, Garrett, how did you get into hardscaping? Mike, that's a bit of a, a long-winded response on my end, but uh, I really think it's important to share my story with, with some guys, uh, existing owners and even uh, technicians and other guys that are maybe thinking about getting or going off into their own. Um, I started young, you know, like a lot of other guys. So I was 15. My friend and I would walk up and down the street, going door to door, cutting grass, kind of same gig as everybody else started, I guess. But uh, I really quickly kind of was drawn to, you know, how can I make this bigger? How can I make this better? I guess the business side, the entrepreneurial side. And uh, it really became more serious when I got my driver's license. Uh, I got my first truck, first trailer, and really started kind of expanding a little bit there and doing everything from grass cutting to cleaning out basements to, to whatever I could almost upsell that client doing, uh, anything that would kind of pay the bills, so to speak. My senior year in high school, 2007, uh, we had a work release program. So I was allowed out at 1030 every day. And my father, myself, and my principal worked a deal that as long as my father signed off on it, I could kind of do my own thing. So I, I kind of started my business then, senior year. I uh, drove my truck to school and, and left at 10:30 and, and went to work. So my father co-signed my first dump truck that year. I drove it to school, drove it to parties, drove it to everywhere in between, and uh, that was kind of my first real responsibility: truck payment, insurance, diesel fuel, uh, the whole nine. So you know, we co-signed it to help me get going, and uh, I took it from there. Did a first walkway and a patio project for our, our family accountant at the time, and that's when I really really found out I was really interested in the construction and the hardscape end. And uh, I quickly signed up for an ICPI certification course, took that course, and then very quickly learned I did a lot of things wrong the first time. Uh, there really wasn't a lot of online influence, uh, YouTube and stuff around at the time. So ICPI for me was kind of my Bible. Uh, the business snowballed. I, I grew quick. We doubled year over year. Um, I started diversifying into other franchises, starting and building and selling and developing. Uh, 2015, I had a lot going on. Felt like I had it all figured out, top of the world, so to speak. Brought in a bunch of managers to, to kind of run uh, maintenance, run construction, run the office. And uh, long story short, I mean, I just kind of had the wrong people in the wrong places. But most importantly, you know, they didn't have any systems. They didn't have any policies. They just kind of were put in place and hoped they could figure it out. I, I really didn't give them the roadmap that was in my head. 2016, we cut the company in half. Um, you know, 2015 was rough. We almost uh, honestly had to shut the doors. And uh, so we, we pulled out of that. And uh, 2016, cut it in half and refocused. We got rid of maintenance, focused on design build. And we've been working ever since on focusing doing more with less. And uh, here we are, 2020, continuing to focus on that same deal. We've rebuilt to a solid core, guys. we got three, four crews running at all times. We do some really fun projects. We do some really cool projects. And, uh, you know, I recently met a, a colleague now, I would consider him, uh, successful in the business. And he said a quote to me that, that really stuck and it really just kind of rejuvenated exactly what I've been trying to do the last few years and get back on track here is, uh, he said, you know, my goal is for some day to come into work and for the team to send me home because I'm just getting in the way. And honestly, Mike, isn't that what we all want? Absolutely. And there's a couple things in there that, uh, really caught my ear as you you were saying that we just had, uh, Stanley Genetic on the show and he was talking about how he cut his company in half and that really helped him grow his business. And we've gotten a lot of messages from people saying how interesting that was that he was talking about that and how they learned just from that short interview that we had with him. So I want to ask you, Garrett, what, what does it look like when you own a business and you discover that, you know what, maybe you need to start cutting your business in half or cutting people from your business like how, how do you know that that was the solution in your business you know i'll be honest and you know i did listen to that interview with stanley and that was one that really resonated with me out of all the podcasts and uh honestly ego gets in the way i'll be the first to admit it i mean we're all out there 
buying new equipment, building businesses, doing all kinds of cool stuff. But, uh, you know, you lose sight a little bit and it's tough to tell yourself that downsizing could actually be better. Doing more with less could be more profitable. And at the end of the day, that's, that's what we're in it for. You know, we're running a business for the independence, but also to be profitable and hopefully someday either sell it or, or have a, a system that runs without you. And, uh, you know, it's a little daunting. And, and for me, it was, it was financially. I mean, I had to, I had no other option. I had to do it. I had to reorganize. I had to, uh, come to realization that it had to be done. Going back to the very beginning, you, you talked about getting into this industry in high school, and that's such an interesting program that, you know, your high school set up there for you to be able to, to leave in your senior year to, you know, work. Now, what, what was it that influenced you to get into this type of work? Like, what was that, that spark that made you fall in love with this industry as opposed to, you know, starting a different business or starting something else? You know, honestly, Mike, there wasn't a specific spark. Um, and I say that because I, I kind of want some other guys to resonate with that and the fact that I didn't get into it because I fell in love with landscaping right off the rip. Um, I fell in love with business right off the rip. I fell in love with, you know, the entrepreneurial side of things. And it could have been grass cutting. It could have been tree work. It could have been building houses, anything in the contracting world. It could have gone any direction. And I think the fact that I started with grass cutting and landscaping and then had that opportunity to start getting into hardscape, that's when I really realized uh, not only do I like the business, um, but but I do actually enjoy this industry. And those two paired together, uh, you know, the sky's the limit after that. Give us a timeline of uh, when you started your business. And then, you know, where where were your leads coming from when you first started your business? What was what got you that traction to uh, kind of continue on your business? Yeah, so, I mean, we'll rewind again all the way back to 2007, senior year in high school driving a dump truck to school and then driving off at 1030 to go to work. Um, it was door to door. It was boots on the ground. It was business to business. You know, I, I would ask clients for referrals and friends and families and walk into businesses to see if they were taking bids, um, cold calling, cold knocking, you know, whatever it took to get people to hear me out. And, and it was difficult. I'll be honest. I was, you know, 17, 18 at the time. I didn't have much experience. Didn't have a fancy website with portfolios and this and that. So, you you know, you got to take what you can get in the beginning. And, uh, you know, I think Sean mentioned it, uh, Premier Outdoor recently that, you know, you're going to you're going to take a couple hits early on, too, because you <laughs> you want to give the client everything. Uh, you really want to wow those first few clients and then it snowballs from there. And you can't be afraid of the bottom dollar on every single job. So you got to be able to kind of kind of take that with a grain of salt in the beginning. But, uh, you know, fast forward all the way up to now, you know, that's marketing is is so different compared to what it was when I started, at least. And, and we're getting, I would say, at least 50% of our referrals are word of mouth and repeat contractors that we've built relationships with. And the other 50% are some form of digital, whether it be social media or website presence or Google paid ads, et cetera. Going off that, with your sales process, you know, these leads come in and they somebody, you know, reaches out to you by email, by phone call, or through any of your ads or whatever it may be, they reach out to you. Where do you take that conversation from there? Well, Mike, I'm in my office right now and I'm staring at a whiteboard and this is this is the most simple system that works really well for us and granted you can make an excel sheet or a google sheet or whatever but you know this is a good visual in my office that myself and my manager have that we use as a talking point but this whiteboard literally says lead consult design estimate sold complete so that lead comes in and we try to keep that lead as hot as possible we sell most of our work aside from our reputation due to our communication so if that lead comes in, I'm calling them, emailing them, whichever, as fast as possible. And then I want to meet with them as fast as possible. And then I want to get them through the entire process as fast as reasonably possible. So communication for us has really been our 
honestly our number one sales tool. I mean, we literally get jobs just for showing up to the estimate. It still amazes me. Um, people blow off clients for a few days and, and, and the industry that we in, we're in, everybody wants everything so quick. They're on their phone. They want to, they want to talk about a patio. They're emotional at that point, ready to go. And they don't want to wait. They, they just, they won't wait a week. If you can't get back to them in a day, you know, chances are they're already lined up someone else. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that speed is such an important factor when you are, uh, you know, trying to close that deal. And obviously you've put a, an emphasis on, uh, you know, that communication with the customer. And I love the idea of having a visual in the office that, you know, you can also not only communicate with the customer but you're communicating with your team you've built the system around this which is awesome yes one of those columns will have dates so if the lead came in today and i'm still staring at that lead three days from now and they haven't moved over to the consult column you know i can i can hold the next guy accountable to okay why isn't this oh well i left a message and just waiting to hear back okay fine or, oh, I haven't had a chance to call. Well, you know, we've already kind of lowered our chance of sale by X amount just by not getting to that person that quick. And, and you know, it's all within reason, right? You're going to have, you know, your consultation. You're going to have design work may take longer for one job than it will for another, um, et cetera. So this process is going to vary job to job, but it's just a simple, good visual thing to really hold us accountable. And it's really helped with closing. After somebody contacts you and you, you talk with them, what are you doing to pre-qualify them to know that, you know, you going out there for that first consultation is not wasting your time uh, or not wasting your time and the customer's time? Like, what, what questions are you asking in that initial conversation? Yeah, pre-qualification is crucial. I mean, you know, time is money and, and your time is valuable. And I've heard it in a, in a lot of uh interviews and podcasts everybody kind of talks about it and, and it is crucial and everybody has their different approach for us we're definitely starting with you know a, a phase one pre-qualification either via email or via phone call and that's going to be fairly preliminal so you know what kind of project what scope of work um, to make sure that they're not looking for maintenance or some other work that maybe we don't do but also the size of the job, you know, are they just looking for a front walkway or are they looking for an outdoor living space? You know, we don't do a lot of smaller jobs anymore. We've kind of shifted our focus a little bit just with the way we're set up in our overhead. So we have, you know, other people we can refer out for that. And that's crucial to start with that preliminary. And then if they get through, you know, phase one, you know, this is usually, which is usually with the office, you know, there's, what I would consider a phase two pre-qualification. Now you have your sales guy, your designer, or myself, you know, in front of this client. You're, you, you know, you got a pulse on the project now. You've talked about it. Now's the time to start talking budget. Everybody hates to talk budget. No one knows what it's going to cost. Oh, you're the professional. You tell me. You have to be ready to talk budget or talk budget range or at least be able to give them something to bite into there so you're not wasting your time on any further design or estimating. Um, you should be able to sit there and say, well, a kitchen's going to start at 10,000 and a fireplace is going to start at 8,000 and X amount of square feet of patio is going to start at whatever, 20,000. You know, okay. You're in the 40 to $60,000 range and just, just wait for it. Just wait for that expression. I mean, their face says it all, you know, if they're, if they're, they're facing you and they're good and no problem. Okay. Let's talk design, let's talk estimate, and let's talk the process. But if that scares them, you know, let's try to talk some options. And then if it doesn't fit, at least you can respectfully decline without wasting any more time. And then when you're figuring out that that design process, what's going to go into their, their living space or what's, you know, what, what's going to be incorporated into that design? What questions are you asking them to get to the bottom of things that uh, you know that you're going to include this in the design? Yes, I mean that's another really important thing uh, when you when you are having that consultation to be discussing how they're going to use the space, um, maybe how many people they're going to be entertaining uh, long term. I always like to ask the question, you know, you do, do you plan on being here for a while? Do you see yourself, you know, using this space any differently in the future? In other words, maybe a pool isn't in the play right now, budget wise, but are you going to want a pool in the future? You know, let's design accordingly. 
Um, so again, time is money and design time is money. So, you know, ask as many questions as you can to get a good feel on what they want. And, and actually, Mike, I finished a consult yesterday, you know, mid-sized project. And at the end of it, he said, I might be stepping over, over boundaries or stepping on toes here, but I got to say, you know, I met with another contractor yesterday. And now that I just met with you, I realized he just downright didn't even listen to me. You know, I don't know what I got out of it. He came here and he sketched this and he painted this and did that. And I don't, I don't think I got a dozen words in. So I always like to listen first. Um, you know, I know different designers have different approaches, but I like to listen first. These people live in these houses. Um, they know how they're going to want to use the space typically. And then I'll throw my suggestions. All right, well, that's a great idea, but, you know, that might not work this way. What do you think about this? And then, you know, they're obviously asking for your professional opinion, so give them your insight and go from there. But, man, the, the people just, they most of them are going to value just or respect the fact that you're going to listen to their ideas first. Asking those questions and listening and uh, is such an important process when you're getting to know what features are going to go into their design. And when it comes to designing, what software do you run? Do you like to use to be able to to drop these designs for them? So majority of our designs are UVision uh, by Unilock. If we're doing 3D rendering, which most of the time we are, by far hands down uh, one of the best tools we've added to the business over the last few years. Uh, relatively low cost of entry, pretty user friendly, you know, and it's, it's good, but it's not too good. You know, I think it was Sean actually mentioned it too, like that the design world, the 3D design world sometimes holds us a little too accountable for certain unrealistic finishes or design flaws in reality. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great program. It's a good bang for your buck and it's pretty easy to use. Yeah, that's that was an interesting point that, you know, sometimes these 3D designs these days are, are they look incredible and they look sometimes better than the final product, but you want that final product to look better than that design and uh and yeah, Uvision is definitely one of the the softwares that we recommend people to to get into for sure. And uh you know, when when you're doing that first consultation, you're adding so much value into uh, into that customer's world and in, in what they're designing and what they want to get into. So do, are you charging for that first consultation with them? You know, right now we do not charge for a consultation. Consultation for now is still free. Gotcha. And any any justification as to why uh, it's free at this point and do you intend to maybe move to a, a paid model in the future you know we're, we're tossing the idea around for next year trying it but you know the flip side is we do have a decent pre-qualification process so you know, as long as we're doing our job in the office to start we're kind of weeding out a lot of that you know beforehand anyway so the better job we do at that the better we are you know, I think charging a small fee, whether it be 50 bucks or 100 bucks or, or whatever, but small fee really might just step us up one step closer into that um, pre-qualification pre process and really make sure by the time we show up, you know, this person is is not wasting our time or their time. But again, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a debated subject. We we still don't charge for it now, but we're we're considering it in the future. Yeah, and it definitely my thought process as well. We don't we don't charge a, a consultation fee either, and yeah, that's the same justification as I have is that you know I should be doing a good job with my pre qualification, and adding that fee would also pre qualify a little bit further, but then it may leave a bad taste in some people's mouths. So yeah, same same thought process on our end as well, which is always nice to hear uh, somebody you know just getting uh, different perspectives on in the industry on that that initial consultation fee and what people are doing. Now, when it comes to payment plans, you know, a customer wants to go ahead with you and uh, they're ready to sign that contract. What do your payment plans look like with customers and does it does it vary from job to job? Yeah, payment plans will vary job to job and most of it's going to be down to the uh, size of the project as well as who we're working for. Most of it's pretty similar. Um, you know, a medium or smaller project, we're doing, you know, 50% down progress payments, uh, either weekly or biweekly, and then a balance on completion. 
that's kind of, you know, 80% of it. The larger projects, obviously someone's not going to cut you a hundred thousand dollar check for a $200,000 job, or at least a lot of people are not going to. So we might do 10 or 20% down. And then as we start completing line items or even just progress requests, uh, we have it built in our contracts that we can bill that out up, up to weekly. And we'll do weekly or biweekly, depending how long we're there. And then in the commercial world, I mean, we do some commercial work, a, a fair bit of it anyway, and we're kind of just stuck with whatever they say for payment terms. So uh, oftentimes you're going into a couple hundred thousand dollar jobs without even a deposit, and then you're looking at 60 to 90 day terms. So to kind of play in the in the commercial arena, you definitely you got to have some cash on hand to be able to do that. But, um, you know, we try to keep it flexible to the client, but sturdy enough behind the office so we don't get too confused with too many options so what do you prefer garrett do you prefer the commercial work or the residential oh, i love them both you know there's pros and cons to both i love the i love the result of the residential i love outdoor living spaces poolscapes do a ton of them i love working with clients they appreciate you usually um, that relationship but then on the commercial side uh you know it, it it's black and white. You got plans, you got specs, you follow it, you get the job done, you get paid. There's no opinions. There's no, oh, well, I, you know, I don't like this stone here or that stone there. It's, it's black and white. So it's, it's, you know, it's a little easier. And, and for us, some of our commercial jobs are some of our larger projects. So we are working with some larger equipment and trucks and such. And, uh, honestly, I'm just particularly fond of that without getting fully into site construction. Um, it kind of kind of leaves us pretty open to do some cool stuff. Now, I want you to add value in a different way, and that's through a horror story, uh, a bad situation that you, maybe you got yourself into, or even with payments, like we've been talking about payments, uh, you know, any, any horror story that you'd want to share with us to kind of help us and our audience uh, look at something that maybe we can implement in our business to avoid a situation like that. Do you have a bad experience on a job site or even with a payment plan that you'd want to share? Yeah. So, um, you know, without getting too detailed, in summary, I've got a ton of horror stories. Um, I mean, this is our 13th year in business. I started it from scratch. So from no contracts to multiple page contracts to one page contracts and everything in between, um, you know, every single year there's a horror story. Um, I usually count on one. Quite frankly, I budget for one. I add a little lump sum in the budget because something's going to come up. And that could be, you know, a contractor stiffing you for a change order that he doesn't feel as though he should pay you to a unreasonable residential client that you just can't you just can't win with or you just can't make happy no matter what. So, you know, I, I plan for it, I budget for it. Um, but to give an example, again, in the contracting world, change orders are a huge one. You know, if you're you're not up to to par on signed change orders, that's an easy way to get stiffed. And and we're talking five thousand, ten thousand dollars at a time. But in the residential world, a, a funny example that I can use uh, was about a $150,000 backyard pool renovation project that went completely sideways on us, all because the U-Vision 3D design showed the pool coping when it made the radius for the pool corner. For some reason, the detail just made these zigzag joint lines. And she was expecting zigzag joint lines. <laughs> and that was the beginning of what turned into a very sideways conversation. And, and we, we ended up, we ended up kicked off the job actually, because we, she just couldn't grasp the fact that that's, that's not what was happening. And here's why. And this is just a rendering and et cetera. So, I mean, you know, some other underlying factors that were going on, I guess, uh, with, with the house and some other work on it. But, uh, yeah, that was a, that was one right there. So I mean, we walked off. We probably lost ten, fifteen grand at the point um, of which we were at with the project and materials we had. And uh, it's just one you got to take with a grain of salt and move on. Yeah, that's definitely tough. And uh, I mean, in, in that situation, how do you handle something like that when the if the customer wants you off the project, off the job site? Do you? Uh, 
yeah, that's tough. Like, do you do you try to uh, make your points, or do you just accept what the customer's saying and and you know wish them the best and move on? Well, I mean, that was the first and the only time I've actually legitimately been, so to speak, kicked off a, a project. Um, again, no fault of of our own or anybody in the team. But, um, you know, we took it for what it was. I mean, she, she clearly was a little unrealistic with her expectations. And, you know, after a conversation with her on the job site, I knew it wasn't going to go anywhere. So, you know, there wasn't any point in going any deeper and saying anything any more derogatory. At that point, she had her mind made up and, you know, we were cleaning up and removed our equipment the same day and took what we could for materials. And, and that was that. Yeah, definitely an interesting situation. Now, moving this away from that, uh, you know, do you have anything in your installation process, any methods, techniques, tips, anything, uh, any tools, equipment that you live by on the job site that you would not uh, start a new company without? I, w- I wouldn't be able to put my finger on any one particular item. Um, I am a huge fan of, of lasers. Um, I know a lot of guys mention zip levels. We have those as well. Those are great for quick, easy grade changes. Um, but we train most of our guys on lasers so they can do their slope and, and carry proper slope right from subgrade to base to screed rails and everything in between. So, uh, you know, we do run lasers on every crew and I think that's crucial to 80% of the work that we're doing from a small tool perspective. And I mean, from a big tool perspective, I mean, anybody that's met me, I, I uh, usually give them the phrase, you know, something along the lines that we'll buy it and figure out how to pay for it. Um, you know, I've got a lot of equipment. I've got a lot of tools. I've invested a lot in the convenience factor and the efficiency. Um, anything from a, an Encon tilt rotator to um, Unilift uh, from Unilock, vac- other vacuum systems, other t- specialty tools. So, you know, I guess my takeaway point should be don't be afraid to to spend that spend that money on that tool or or that piece of equipment and build it in your budget. Um, you know, I'm not saying do it recklessly. Obviously, we all have a business to run and and we can only afford so much, but you know, if you're doing it smart and thinking about it, if it's going to make the efficiency, if it's going to help retain employees, like you know, some guys get too stuck on that big number just you know, sign on the dotted line. Banks are almost giving away money for for zero percent now. I mean, you know, if you can't make that back, I mean, it's more valuable in my pocket than for that. So just, you know, be smart with your money, but don't be afraid to spend it to to grow if you want. Excellent, excellent advice. And how about people in the industry that you look up to, or even since beginning your business, people that have been mentors in your life? Or even uh, through the online community, uh, you know, designs that influence you and people that influence you. Do you want to give any shout outs to any of those people? You know, we got a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of Instagram relationships, a lot of guys out there. We've got kind of a smaller core group that we talk to, uh, you know, on a day to day basis. So, you know, a quick shout out to those guys. Of course, we got Andy at, uh, he's going to love me saying, but MMSSRIWRI. And don't edit that out because he'll love that. <laughs> Jeremy from J Squared, Sean over at Premier Outdoor. You know, it's, it's a core group that we talk to. I got local guys over here. My buddy Fletcher at Equidnik Landscaping, and uh, Josh over at Mass Hardscapes. So, I mean, you know, quick shout out to them. But most importantly, man, I mean, my wife and my parents, hands down. Um, you know, a quick little backstory. You know, my, my biological father passed away when I was seven. My mother and my grandmother raised me. Uh, my mom being, I guess, a single mom for most of my more pain in the butt years. Um, grandmother helping her. I mean, I, I got to give it to her, man. She, she did, she did an awesome job for what she had to do it with. She raised me to work hard. She, she had since married. My stepfather now helped kind of continue to instill that whole mentality of nothing's handed to you you know you got to work for it and uh when the opportunity comes it's up to you whether you take it and run with it or take it and drop it so i mean my parents by far and then of course my wife so my wife and i met in high school sophomore year which is actually one year before i started doing any of this and we've been together ever since married just had a baby four months ago five months ago congratulations 
we lived together for, I don't know, six, seven years by now. And, uh, I mean, I don't know. I lucked out, man. I really did. She's, she's awesome. She's a rock. She never complained from high school to now about, you know, if I'm working late or, you know, Hey, I can't go to that party cause I got to wake up Saturday and, and go to work, you know, and, and that's, I'll be honest, that has to contribute to some of my success, being able to know that I have that. And, and she's just been super supportive on the, all the ups and downs and, you know, she'll give me her two cents, but at the end of the day, you know, she respects everything I do. And I mean, she, she kicks some butt and I respect everything she does for us. That's a beautiful story. And, you know, uh, being an entrepreneur, being a business owner, it's, it's got it up. It's, Got its ups and downs, but when you have a uh, like a stable family home, a rock at home, uh, it definitely, definitely contributes to some sort of stability in your life. And uh, obviously, you found that with your wife and with your your uh, your family now that you've created. Absolutely, it's crucial. And then uh, wrapping this interview up, I've got one last question for you, and that's you know you've you've gone through a lot with your business and. You've gone through many different stages in your business, and you've more than likely learned numerous things that you've been able to apply to your business over the years. We've heard about a lot of different things that you've talked about, you know, from systems to budgeting and and your numbers and all that throughout this interview. And I just want to ask you one thing that you wish you'd known from the very beginning of starting your business. One thing that you know now that you wish you'd known from the very start, what would that be? You know, Mike, that's a loaded question, and uh, and you you mentioned a few things there, and I'm glad I kind of got a few points across, and I I really wanted to take this opportunity of this interview to to kind of share my story and hope it resonates with others. You know, you, you, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, you know, you're you're the face. You know, at least when you get going, you're the first one to be in, you're the last one out, you're the first one to not get paid. You know, if you get paid at all that week. You know, there's there's so many things emotionally that, you know, I never really accounted for. I don't mind the hard work, the hustle, the grind, get in, get it done, work seven days a week, do what it takes. But, uh, you know, had someone sat me in a room and told me, hey, you're about to, you know, strap in, you're about to ride a emotional roller coaster. I, I think that's something that's just not often discussed. You know, yeah, we discuss the hardships and the horror stories and the stress of employees and all this. But, you know, downright, man, I mean, it's an emotional roller coaster. I don't mind admitting it and you know, I'd be the first to, to get it out there on air, so to speak. So so guys can kinda talk to each other about it. You know, we can kinda open up a little bit about it, you know. You know, there's there's times where there's, you know, cash flows stretched so thin, you're wondering how to make it to the next week. Or uh, you know, you're catching up on the calendar and you know, you're wondering if you're gonna have enough work next week and then the phone rings and then you're booked up for two months and you don't know how to, you know, how you're gonna get it all done. Or, uh, you know, you're watching one of your employees hit one of your trucks with one of your trucks in your parking lot. You know, the frustration of employees. We could share stories for days on that. Um, you know, and, and, but at the end of the day, it's your name. It's your reputation. It's your credit. You know, if you fail, you know, the guys can go down the road for a job. You know, you, what are you going to do? You know, that affects your entire life. And, uh, you know, another point in that, you know, just, and I, I guess I'll close on, on these notes is, you know, social media is awesome. Instagram is awesome for marketing, for networking, everything in between. But, you know, just keep in mind, and this is really to the guys that are kind of just starting out or, or maybe struggling a couple of years in, you know, not every, not everyone's as successful as their pictures are going to let on. Like everybody's got a story behind there. And, and uh just just think about that when you're when you're kind of feeling down about it and uh we've all been through it and we're all going through it and uh that same colleague that shared that quote to me earlier recommended a book for me and I'll start by saying I've read five books in my life I hate reading I'm not good at reading I always you know kind of freaked out when the teacher called on me to read out loud like, it's just not my thing but I picked this book up and I'm going to recommend it to everyone. And it's the E-Myth Revisited Version by Michael Gerber. And, yeah, there's a bunch of, you know, business fluffy stuff in there that, you know, you can take with a grain of salt. But the absolute core values are in there, and there's so much that's relative to business owners. 
you know, and the biggest quote really is, you know, there's entrepreneurs and then there's technicians suffering from an entrepreneurial seizure. So, you know, the guy that's frustrated with his boss saying, oh, I can do this on my own. I'm just going to go start my own business, not realizing he's just going to go start his own business, doing the same thing that he's doing now, putting more time into it because now he's got the whole business end to deal with all to make less money. So, you know, there, there's kind of a, a place for everyone in that. And don't feel like you need to go and start your own business. You can have a super successful career doing everything that we discuss in all these interviews within an existing business, you know, being a manager or being a foreman. Um, so, you know, a lot of a lot of stuff out there on social media is kind of pushing guys to do that. But just don't get caught up in the fact that you have to be on your own to do it. You can do it as part of a team. And uh, that was just my last little point I wanted to get across. Yeah, and I love that point that, you know, being a business owner it really isn't for everybody. And being able to reflect on yourself and know what, what's right for yourself uh, and understanding that maybe owning a business isn't for you because it's not for everybody and understanding that you can be an amazing, you know, number two somewhere and, uh, and make a living off that uh, is so important. And I, I love that point because it's, it's not addressed and it's not talked about in, in, the online world for sure and uh, excellent excellent way to uh, close this interview garrett thank you so much for joining us mike thank you so much